Behind the well-known public face of the British monarchy lies a story previously untold on film. Every now and then you inherit something special which gives an extra edge to the whole thing. We're on a journey with the Prince of Wales to reveal the dozens of artists in the royal family tree who have left an extraordinary treasure trove of art spanning five fascinating centuries. Looking through acrylic toys, sketchbooks, and some of them are really remarkable, I think. Others of us were really very good, as you'll see. They did actually pursue it to a point in which they wanted to be as good as a professional. Royal Paint Box was made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. When I first saw Queen Victoria's painting kit, as a filmmaker and watercolour painter myself, I was really surprised to find out that 150 years ago, she was an artist. Her great-great-great-grandson, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, also enjoys painting. And for the first time on film, he agreed to tell me the extraordinary story of the tradition of art in his family through the ages. She was doing it in those days on her writing paper, not like I started. And in the search for the earliest evidence of art in the royal family, we'll discover literally dozens of other talented artists. As you see, these are wonderful, these watercolors. Revealing an extraordinary treasure trove of creativity by royal hands. There's your not quite spelt right there. <laughs> we'll be finding out more about their art and what their art means to them. I think, you know, drawing from nature, observing nature is absolutely crucial. I've you know, obviously been inspired by just looking. It's usually the light is what catches my attention. You can look at the same view over and over again and suddenly, one moment, there's the most magical light. You know, I sometimes paint in the evenings, and every now and then, it's when it dries suddenly, it is exactly what I was looking for. You think, how do I do that? Which part of me has it come from? Imagine Windsor, you're surrounded by the most marvellous things. Because when you were small, you'd rush about, you know, peddling or something up and down the corridors and along, and you notice nothing, it's just the background. Suddenly, literally, and I must be 14 or something. Suddenly all the pictures on the walls and furniture just came into focus. Look, do you know what I mean? And they'd just been blurred sort of backgrounds, which were just, just there. Then suddenly I started looking. Amongst this incredible collection of masterpieces by artists like Canaletto and Rembrandt, we found art actually done by members of the royal family themselves. And we were given a very special guided tour. This old painting was done by my father, the Duke of Edinburgh, when I was a child, 
It's of the Queen having breakfast in the private dining room here at, at Windsor Castle. His father passed on this interest by showing the Prince of Wales how to paint when he was young. My father's paintings, like many by my forebears, were done for pleasure on public and private trips. This rarely seen lino cut of a circus horse was done by the Queen when she was young. So they could the horse. Yes, she must have been sort of eight or nine, I suppose, or younger. But that was done for for the, their parents. Like many of these things were done, you know, given to the parents at Christmas time or birthdays or things, you know, like one does as a child. <laughs> I remember doing to my grandmother and others. You know, we walk away and shuffle off our mortal collar, but these, these things live on. That's what's so riveting, I think, about looking at um, other members of my family in the past. It's this feeling that, you know, there they were, you sense them sitting, doing the painting and everything else, and then that stays behind. It's still you. It's a part of you that's still there, you know, the rest of you's gone. We'll be looking through the Prince of Wales' family tree to see if there's evidence of an artistic inheritance. We'll start with the earliest remaining art we can find today. In the fight for the throne of England, Mary, Queen of Scots, was imprisoned by Elizabeth I for nearly 20 years before being executed. With time on her hands, it was in prison that her art was to flourish. I have the impression that Mary, Queen of Scots, is embroidery, which was an art, fascinatingly intricate and very uh, thought out, you know, with these images. It's the first serious art in the royal family. The vine indicates that if you cut me down, further shoots will spring up, other branches, other leaves, because I have a son, I have a family which will go on and increase and multiply, and of course did go on and sits on the throne of England today, so she got that one right. Another royal artist to perfect their craft in prison, this time during the English Civil War, was the great-grandson of Mary, Queen of Scots, Prince Rupert of the Rhine. He lived at Windsor Castle nearly 400 years ago and was known for the special engraving method he pioneered called mezzotint. His inventive artistry survives here to this day and is much admired by the Prince of Wales. He was obviously incredibly skilled, I think. And you wonder whether he didn't do this as a result of what happened to his uncle, King Charles I. It's wonderful that these exist here and show, you know, what talent he had. You can imagine the scale of it was quite a, a job doing a bit of tent like that. Coming from a long line of artists has inspired the Prince of Wales himself to draw and paint as a hobby whenever he too has time to spare, although he's never had formal lessons. We were fortunate to be invited to accompany him to one of his most favourite haunts, a remote spot on the Balmoral Estate in Scotland. I think it was my grandmother probably who inspired me to, or encouraged me to look and observe. I think I must have been quite a, a willing part of that um, suggestion that I observe things. I wanted to, to do more than just take photographs. To me, it didn't give me the same sense of, of satisfaction somehow as, as, as actually trying to do it, you know, with, with eye to hand, to paper. I used to sit myself out on the hill and I'd try and sit and mix things and it would rain and everything went spotty and I thought, oh God, 
So I then eventually decided years later that I'd do it all inside. So I then do a sketch and put a note saying what the colours were and what, where the sun was and all that stuff. Which is actually incredibly good training because it makes you uh, look much more carefully, I think. And try to train yourself to retain the thing in your mind. I love painting snowscapes. There's something awfully satisfying about trying to bring, you know, make the white paper become snow. So you're doing everything in reverse, you know, putting in the, the darker bits to try and create that, that, that same sort of feeling. Over the years, a talent for art has surfaced again and again in the royal family. But is this genetic? Or do they traditionally choose to spend their time developing their artistic skills? The Prince of Wales is especially interested in the next artist he's going to show us. Arguably the most cultured monarch ever to sit on the throne of Great Britain. Four generations on from Prince Rupert of the Rhine, Everybody's taught that King George III was the Mad King. But in the library at Windsor Castle are some of the most remarkable and beautiful treasures, which I hope will redress this simplistic view of him. King George III had um, instruction in drawing, and particularly looking at architectural drawing, as that was considered an important uh, part of his education. I suppose all, you know, all these things he did were exercises in you know, observation, perspective. He clearly developed his eye buildings and you know, the whole history of scale and proportion of the years. So clearly it was an interest that remained with him for the rest of his life. His interest in art and architecture led him to give his active support and a very generous benefaction to the Royal Academy of Arts. He was very much of his time in that in the mid-18th century many more people of his ilk learnt to draw, were encouraged to draw, were expected to draw as recreation. I do think it's plausible that somebody who's very busy and exercised with issues of constitutional governance, anxious about the French Revolution, might have decided that drawing a classical temple was a way of taking his mind off the rest of his life. He used this illustration of a, uh, a temple at Palmyra, now in Syria. God knows what will happen. I pray that you know, they won't destroy this. But he meant this wonderful thing of transposing that into a wonderful sylvan landscape, you know, with the water and the boat on it. <laughs> It's very interesting the way he's tamed the landscape and also I was very interested about the trees, the way he'd done them mm. and the work on the trees is remarkable. But they all, I mean at that time, the 18th century, there was a particular way of doing the trees but it, it took an awful lot of effort because you had to 
use the pencil, little, little sort of circles, do you see? And then smudge, presumably. They're very effective. first serious bout of the king's illness, now recognized as porphyria, which was extremely severe. I mean, he's one of those people I always felt that had been much maligned by history. Now, I, was dis I discovered the other day that he was using products through his hair and things like that, which may have had arsenic in because they've taken hairs from him, he says, and, and sent them to the to a laboratory and discovered the very extraordinary levels of arsenic. So it could be that the use of arsenic in some of these, I don't know, medications or something had, you know, made it even worse. His delusions and his awful delirium and everything else that this poor man had to, to go through. So, I mean, obviously the disease, the problem caused the most appalling pain and everything else, of course, drives you mad. There are very few drawings by him after this date. The effect of the king's illness on the queen and their much-loved 15 children was cataclysmic. The normal process of marriage for the daughters was halted, effectively leaving them in limbo with unlimited leisure time. They spent their hours botanising, studying flowers and plants at the family's artistic retreat, Frogmore House, not far from Windsor. Princess Elizabeth was, I think, the most artistic, the most fun of the daughters, who had a real spark for life. She learned how to do oils and watercolours. That's really good, though, you know, the drops of water on leaves and things. And a bird's nest, you see. Brilliant. The moss. When Elizabeth was finally married, she moved to Germany and her art took another turn. She filled her time cutting out silhouettes, which she sent back to her sisters. These are, I mean, they're, they're beautifully cut out by Elizabeth using her scissors, um, and they could be used in all sorts of different decorative ways. So here, in these balaster strips, you have brown cutouts against black, here you have a black cutout, which could be laid against white. I was just about to drop a child into a bucket. <laughs> Give it a wash or something. Oh, fun, isn't it? This room is called the Charlotte Closet, and hanging in the room now are a wonderful series of drawings in the style of etchings done by Charlotte, the Princess Royal. The girls weren't the only creative members of the family. Their little brothers were taught art as well. These ones are all by the Duke of Sussex and the Duke of Cumberland when they were small. You can imagine, these were done at the age of nine or seven or something. Obviously it was a combined approach with the, the teacher because, I mean, to achieve this sort of level of competence at that age would be very difficult, I think. It's um, very good use of gouache, isn't it? Isn't it? You get a lovely picture of them all being taught art yes, in exactly the tradition that. of handing down. Well, exactly that, yeah. yeah. In our search through the dozens of artists in the royal family tree, we came across an era bursting with creativity. Another very creative member of my family was my great-great-great-grandmother, 
Queen Victoria. She and her husband, Prince Albert, spent much of their private time at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, drawing and painting out of the public gaze. And many of the oil paintings by Queen Victoria and members of her family still hang at Osborne House. They both are terribly aware of the importance of art, but for Victoria, I think it's more an emotional thing, an outlet for her emotion, and for Albert, it's much more of a sort of a duty thing. Like many of my forebears, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had both been encouraged to draw as children, and they were very well taught. This intriguing sketchbook was done by my great-great-great-grandfather, Prince Albert, aged 12. It probably came over in his luggage from Germany. Rather interesting, you see, that he has a great eye in those sketches for soldiers. He's always looking at perhaps what princes are trained to look at, which is, you know, what medals you've got on, what uniform you're wearing, and what's ribbons and stripes. That is the ability. They're full of energy, aren't they? They're full of endless sort of disasters and military subjects. Just galloping that way and shooting somebody coming from behind. <laughs> Gracious, look at this. These horses are quite good, aren't they? Albert was a rather poetic, unusual character. And above all, he was interesting because he was a modernizer. And one of his passions was the idea of the reformed family. And I think he brought one of the most significant pedagogical ideas of the 19th century with him from Germany, and that is the idea of the kindergarten. Queen Victoria was very, very fortunate and quite actually in some ways unusual in, in having nine children within 17 years without losing any. She spent hours sketching them. This album, treasured by the royal family, gives us a unique insight into her as both artist and mother. Because we didn't have cameras, it was crucial to do this, otherwise you had no records at all. The amazing thing is the time that they had. She was doing it in those days on her writing paper, well, like I started. I think those early sketchbooks are extremely interesting, the, the, the pictures of the children. Um, she, 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 she had a, a great, great powers of observation. She was fascinated by people. She's drawing tender pictures of her own children. She's scribbling portraits of the Prime Minister on her blotter, whatever it might be. But she obviously had felt a sort of tenderness for her children. I think these are so incredibly nice. That must have been a... <laughs> It's like Windsor to me. Adorable. Back to you. Dressing up again. <laughs> it was. It's Alfred. I mean, art is such a, a wonderful record, this, I think. That's the um, Kaiser. <laughs> Not this back room. Both Victoria and Albert insist that their children should have drawing and um, painting um, and handwriting too, sort of factored into their timetables, which are set up from a very early age, from the age of four. That was part of the accepted um, approach to bringing out children, making sure they had you know, an adequate understanding of the arts. You're going to begin by using a wash, using a brush, um, and then later on you'll have a chance to use a line. So it might mean you've got layers of, of wash and figures or layers of drawing, and that will just give it a sense of movement because it is a quick posing class. The Prince of Wales set up his drawing school in London with the idea of passing on the tradition of drawing, just like the Victorians and the Georgians had before him. 
Today, the school runs classes for all ages. I think what His Royal Highness is absolutely passionate about is helping students see that art is something that is the most wonderful resource to feed off and to inspire them and to help them exercise their imaginative muscles. If you don't have that training, I suppose, you don't have the business of encouraging somebody to use their eye, then you miss an awful lot of the world around us. Queen Victoria's eldest son, my great-great-grandfather, later King Edward VII, was known as Bertie. His teacher did this thing of getting him to copy his, and in a funny way, I suppose, you did learn a lot by, by having to copy. So that's what happened, I think, in this case here with um, Edward Caldwell doing, doing one and then my great-great-grandfather doing the other. <laughs> that didn't quite work. Obviously a bad day, I think. It's quite difficult to be able to do that. Otherwise he gets quite good. She's not quite spelt right there. <laughs> Billy Ann. <laughs> Prince Alfred was the second son of Queen Victoria and her, and her fourth child. And um, so, in terms of relationships, you know, you can imagine that he's a very great uncle. Afi and Bertie were great friends and rivals, sort of fought each other. And for a short time, they had lessons together. And one time, they were actually caught doing something which was absolutely against the rules, which was smoking. And for this, they were punished. Then I think Kubitura decided that she must have decided that the elder one was a bad influence or something, I don't know. So Prince Alfred was sent off to the Navy. It was very bad luck. <laughs> He then, of course, because he was presumably taught well, produced these marvellous journals of wonderful um, accounts and drawings and things like that. Um, really rather beautiful, you know, topographical watercolours of these ones of the Virgin Islands here. You see, it was extraordinary. Young he was, I'm drawing the name, I suppose, age of 13 or so, 14. Um, there we are, another one. But then there's another one, isn't there, here, I think, which doesn't it have a rather wonderful um, frontispiece? Yes, you see, it's marvelous then. Right, pretty good. That was his next ship, I think. It's, it's interesting because, I mean, he was on the West Indies station, so was I. Like the Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria spent a lot of time in Scotland at her other retreat, Balmoral, where nature and the elements were to further inspire her art. At every turn, you have a picture. These Scotch streams, full of stones and clear as glass, they're most beautiful. The peeps between the trees, the depth of a shadow, the mossy stones mixed with slate. This mixture of wilderness and art is perfection. And some of them are really remarkable, I think, huh? Her little watercolours. And looking out of 
window Balmoral. Uh, that view, I know it so well, is so intriguing. And what's so I find so fascinating is how I have ended up doing the same sort of views. I've known it all my life, you know. I've um, been here since I, before I could remember, really. You know, the inevitably, it's, it's home. And I have tramped across the hills endlessly for the last 60, well, 60 years. You know, they become indelibly part of your life and your soul, really. It's the light on the landscape, on the mountains and the shadows. That's the thing that really catches the, the attention. And it doesn't happen very often for enough. You just suddenly get the right combination. And suddenly it's the dark and the light and the, and the, and the shapes, which are really what I think is so important. It's obviously if I, if I see something, I suddenly have to stop and try to remember it you know, as much as I can. Because it's a very good, I think it's a very good exercise in observation. You have to try and imprint what about colour? What's, what he's seeing in the colours? Yeah, I can't because everybody sees it slightly differently. It depends the way you look at the world. But, um, yes, I mean, it's the... It's then, of course, I have... The fun is thinking while you're looking at it, now, what paint colours am I going to use to create... try to create that feeling? I mean, one of the most, I think, sometimes difficult colours to get is the colour of the birch trees in the winter in that sort of January period when they go they go purple it's the most extraordinary thing the, the bare branches in the autumn in October a lot of the grass goes this orange colour it's quite extraordinary with the frost and, and it is an amazing colour that gets quite exciting too, to try and make the, the yellows and the oranges and the reds look, look, look believable. You know? In 1861, Queen Victoria's husband Albert died. We discovered this had a dramatic effect on her art. She retreated into widowhood for 40 years and her paint box became her solace in his absence. Literally thousands of her paintings remain as testament to this period of mourning. The tragic thing about all this, I think, is that these ones are all done after Prince Albert's death, and it always had things like the third year of my desolation in 1864. Each one says that, first, second, third, fourth. Portraits of the children all but vanished, and instead she painted empty landscapes. In the spirit of a real artist, Queen Victoria expressed her emotions through her art. They saw me on October the 1st, looking out of her window, up, up the D Valley. Wonderful stuff. What she used there, lots of burnt umber, do you think, and things like that.
Albert's death was to affect the art of Queen Victoria's sixth child, Princess Louise, as it had done her mother's. I suppose she was only 12 or 13 or something, so they were all encouraged to, to do something like this, a drawing or a painting, so that's her, with, presumably dreaming of her parents reunited in heaven. But she was quite young, you see, I and mean, these are remarkable, I think. I mean, she, she, Princess Louise was, I mean, a seriously good artist. She had learnt to draw and sketch as any um, young Victorian lady would do, but Princess Louise found it very difficult trying to escape from this stifling attitude of her mother's that nothing should be done to interfere with Victoria's own mourning. Louise found an escape and found her own identity through following sculpture. There was less opposition to the idea of a woman becoming a sculptor than, than there was to a woman doing other kinds of art. And that's possibly because sculpture is connected to monuments and to memorials. And so this was an extension, if, if you like, of the family respect that you know, the descendant, the daughter, was showing to her line, because Louise made a number of sculptures of her family. In 1893, she produced what probably is now her most well-known work, which is a statue of her mother seated as she was at the time of her coronation, which is today to be found in Kensington Gardens. She believed very strongly also in supporting women's work, their, their opportunities and opportunities to become professionals. She was a modern princess. What you get a picture of here is how the Victorian society, as reflected by the ideals of the royal family, the ambitions of the royal family, actually made amateurishness quite professional. I mean, they didn't earn money from it, and of course, by heaven forbid that an aristocrat should think of selling a picture, but they did actually pursue it to a point in which they you know, wanted to be sort of as good, if you like, as a professional. Many of Queen Victoria's children were proficient artists, but these paintings by her eldest daughter, Princess Vicky, show her oddest talents. These ones here are by Queen Alexandra, who was my great-great-grandmother and married my great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII, when he was Prince of Wales. And um, clearly, you know, while she was in Denmark as a child, she had some very good instruction, incredibly competent. Look at that. She had the rocks. Really lovely. You think she did it with this tiny little, you see, that's all it was, a little tiny paint box, a tiny brush. But she clearly had a very natural talent anyway, but they're fantastic. I mean, this is a wonderful one of, of her mother-in-law, Queen Victoria. It's a marvellous figure, isn't it? Must have been at Balmoral or something. It gives you a wonderful snapshot of life. Mm, mm. This is a marvellous view of the River Dee near Abigail, which I know so well, gained by Alexandra Extraordinary. So that must be Loch Mick, where we were. Exactly. Mm, that's it. Prince of Wales' artistic roots are not just on the maternal side. He was really keen to trace back his father's family line. And in our journey, we discovered an astonishing revelation. 
a naval commander who could easily have been a professional artist. My father's grandfather, my great grandfather, Prince Louis of Battenberg, was remarkable in what he could do. I hadn't really fully appreciated what a great artist my grandfather was. He actually had his uh, work, his, his sketches, I mean, they're more sketches, uh, done while he was accompanying my great great grandfather, King of the Seventh, on his his tour of India in 1875, I think it was. And the things he did of that tour were accepted by the Illustrated London News, and you had to be unbelievably good and competent to get into that. So he was, he was again, extraordinary. My grandfather probably inherited quite a bit of it too, because I gather his father also, Prince Alexander, uh, had been an artist as well. And of course, one has to remember in those days, either you drew everything, uh, or, or there was nothing to show people what the experiences were that you'd been through. wonderful drawings that he did on that tour, uh, which he took over from the artist uh, who became ill. His Royal Highness often received jewels and pearls for his wife, a fabulous value, and on which some Maharajas spent a whole year's income. Live animals were often included. On one occasion, a full-grown tiger was led in by four powerful men two holding the collar around the animal's neck and the others around the loins. The beast nearly trod on my toes. <laughs> it gave me a rather a start. On the way home, I made a number of sketches of the different animals and incidents in connection with them. Most comical. <laughs> I sent them to the Illustrated London News and in due course they nearly filled a copy of the paper. I made quite a lot of money and I was elected honorary member of the Institute of Painters in Watercolour. Ah, oh, that was it. The ostrich. This is brilliantly done. He must have had hysterics trying to get this ostrich up the steps. <laughs> His feathers coming out. They're having a terrible time. I do hope the poor bird didn't suffer. Poor creature. And I believe these were destined for the zoo. I wonder how long they survived in the zoo. Sometimes you do tend to be given very extraordinary things. I was given a Russian bear by Khrushchev and Bulgarin in 1955 when they came on a visit. That had to go straight to the zoo. And... Oh, the other boom was a few years ago. We were in Pakistan, right up in the north of Pakistan. I was given a most beautiful shampooed male yak, which was led up. Looking fantastic. And as I said, I couldn't take it back because I don't think it would fit in the crate or something. Anyway, I had to leave it behind. They'd been rather fun to have brought a yak back. And kept it in high growth. That's extraordinary. to be carried on a sort of what is a palangrin or something like his forebears the artist Prince Louis and the Prince of Wales 150 years ago the busy life of the heir to the throne involves a lot of travelling round the world in the glare of the public eye. Although it is more than 15,500 kilometres from London and I'm so jet-lagged that I feel a few sausages short of a barley, 
Uh, it is a great joy to be back here in Australia again, and we are incredibly touched by the warm welcome you've given us both. For keen artists like the Prince of Wales, these hot and exotic destinations provide much artistic inspiration. But increasingly, his busy schedule doesn't include painting, so he invites an unpaid artist to accompany him. I decided back in 1985, I think it was, I'd take an artist with me on every official visit overseas. So I've been doing this for quite a long time. It's quite easy to be amusing, I hope, for one or two people in years to come, possibly. Uh, the results of that. The fact that an artist is around, I find very enjoyable. I enjoy artists. It really was a surprise, a pleasant surprise, when I was asked to go along on this tour of Australia with him. The painting is actually so much more fascinating in posterity terms than sometimes photographs. And so that's why I take them, and also because he keeps the tradition of the Royal Collection going. It's beautiful. In the shade, grand view. What more could you want? And you've got the expert looking over your shoulders. <laughs> oh, I'm dying for that. Yeah, it's a start. <laughs> Thank you. For the prince to take a, an artist, he may not get as complete a record of the plays he's been, he'll get more meaningful work from the, from an artist, one would hope. In my problem, as you imagine, on these overseas expeditions, on the official ones, I haven't got time, so I do little sketches and then I do them when I get back. In Oman, we're, we're, we're put in the desert and just given an hour, let's say, to paint. So I painted him painting the desert. So much of the time he's on duty. And painting allows him a little time for quiet reflection and also a bit of an investigation of things at a, at a deeper level than his whirlwind existence normally allows. Painting like this is, is, is almost meditative in the sense that you, you enter another world. It's most extraordinary. Everything else is excluded. And you become so absorbed. That was the oh yeah, meditation is concentration, really. And then coming out of it, it's like coming out from, it's like drawing a curtain and being dragged back into the real world. I think it's very important to, to, to realize that people, however much they have to spend their life in the public eye, do have a bit of private time and the sort of things that interest them. I think Prince Charles has, has developed enormously, of course, as an artist, and it's always nice to discover that you've in, perhaps inherited something from earlier generations, which uh, I'm no doubt he has. This is um, Huna Mill, near John O'Groats. It's the most wonderful place. You develop a, a system after a bit, and... and the same thing with the with the colours. I tend to have the you know the, the same sort of colours. I've learnt on the whole a bit how you mix them and what produces what. The great thing I you know after a bit is you begin to realise that something like this will look much better 
further away, see as you come away from it. As she goes about a hundred yards, it looks quite good. <laughs> It's a quality of soulfulness, I think, that you bring to it. It's, it, and that's, I think, what the prince has, as well as a sense of discipline he has in all aspects of his life. It seems he's interested in things beyond the surface. He's interested in the enduring qualities of things. in those hot countries is your water evaporates if you're not careful. Those two are the Salu game reserve in Tanzania where there was a terrific amount of rain everything had flooded. But again I was quite pleased with these because it, it has this incredibly humid hot feel to it I think. That's the Serengeti. Um, well the best time of day really is is six o'clock on for two hours. And or either that if you get up early enough in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, at this time of the year, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I know I, I can't I don't want to paint in the middle of the day. It's just it hopeless. Doesn't inspire, doesn't it? It's got no shadow, no contrast, it's, it's in a funny way. Well cypress trees are very Tuscan, yeah, inspiring, aren't they? Yes. And the fun was just you know, outline, highlighting just the, the light on the on the on the edge of the cypress trees again in the evening, because again it was the shadows coming down from that wooded hill, which I thought was so special. By looking at his art, we've been shown another side to the Prince of Wales. Inspired by his forebears, he enjoys spending his spare time painting for pleasure. But he's not the only member of the present generation of the royal family who produces art. Our journey has brought us to the Queen's niece, Sarah Armstrong Jones, a professional artist who's also been inspired by her family. My mother was very creative and artistic, had a, an amazing brain and my father is a photographer, so I think I was in a very creative family background. When she was little, she was surrounded by all these beautiful paintings and things, and I think she wanted to pass it on down to my brother and me. Sarah now jostles for her position in today's busy contemporary art world. I think it was very important to set up with a gallery and to have somebody to represent you. Um, and I'm very lucky to have that in the position that I am now. Hello. Hello Hi, how are you? Hi, Hi Richard. Yes. Hi, Hi, Paul. Everything can arrive okay? Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. Good, yeah. just getting there. We're just moving place and things. We don't show them anon anonymously at our first, so her name's on there. Um, people sometimes make the connection and they'll say oh is, is that princess margaret's daughter and we say yeah yeah so the gouache is probably in the corridor good idea you, could you hang them in one long line yeah yeah just could you come down we don't make any special concession for for her background at all so our main criteria is the, the strength of the work and how the exhibitions work it's good. It's good. <laughs> She's more experimental than some of the other artists that we show. She's really pushing herself. So she's very much a, a professional artist and, and totally dedicated to that activity. The drawings are based from nature. It's just on a larger scale. Because uh, I'm interested to see the pencil line on a larger scale. And sometimes those fit into the old paintings. On 
day, um, I liked what was happening. I think I was trying to experiment a bit, using my drawings m much more in my watercolours, trying to combine the two. Quite liked what was going on. So I'm developing on those paintings now. I try and remember all the colours as much as I can, but I use my reference from the things that I've picked up in the landscape. on this journey, we didn't know what we would uncover. Looking behind the public face of the British monarchy, we found in the royal family a real commitment to art, generation after generation. Each inheriting an appreciation of what practicing art can bring, and also the importance of handing it down. Do you think there's an artistic gene running through your family you've inherited? It must come down, and I hope it. I hope we can pass it down to the next generation. We'll see what comes out of it. My guess is that most families, you know, have people who could do it if they really wanted to. But like all these things, you see, it demonstrates the importance of being introduced at a young age to appreciate things and to look and observe. With such a strong creative tradition, who knows who the next world artist would be? Stay tuned for more on the Royal Paint Box. Visit pbs.org slash arts for fascinating web-only extras from the Royal Paint Box program. Royal Paint Box is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call us at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. was made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.